Hi, I'm Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Really good to be here. Well, you know, I uh, was listening to uh, the story about the uh, sobriety test, and I uh, was reminded of the fact that they now have, and I'm sure you folks are aware of it, they call it the alcoholic Macarena. (laughs) And it goes something like this. Put your hands on the roof, now behind your head, now behind your back. You know, that's a... (laughs) And, and the bottom line is, is that if you be alcoholic, that oftentimes happens to you. I'm real glad to be here. I want to thank Tim and all the folks on the committee for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bob and Mark for picking us up at the airport, and uh, Harley and the uh, luggage committee, and all the folks who uh, got us here. I, uh, I got sober in New York, and I got sober with guys where we were not the brightest bulb in the room. And uh, I'm going to tell you up front that I got through school totally unscarred by education. Uh, I hung out with and got sober with guys. You say, there's a dead bird. We all look up, you know, like. uh, (laughs) My sponsor thinks that Moby Dick is a venereal disease. So it's, uh, you know. uh, So you won't hear anything really deep, uh, you know, (laughs) from me. And I hang out with guys just like that today, where, you know, you say, hey, hey, uh, how come there's a light on the vacuum cleaner? And he says, don't be so stupid, Vinny, in case the power goes off. You know, like, uh, you know. (laughs) You know. So you, so, you get, so you get a deal from, from where we're coming from, you know. And I'm a real alcoholic, you know. People say, you know, some people can look at the glass and see it half empty. Some people can look at the glass and see it half full. I always saw it as too small. So, uh, <laughs> so that's just who I am, you know. I, uh, I, I, I got here because I drank, had nothing to do with my mom. She just had me, you know. Uh, uh, There's a new 12-step program now in California starting to catch on called APODS, you know. I'm sure it'll be here shortly. It's it's adult pigeons of dysfunctional sponsors. And uh, (laughs) so uh, I'm sure it will be sweeping the nation, you know. Stuff seems to start in California. The next thing you know, in Quebec, they're going, hey, mate, you hear about this, you know. But that's just the way it is. I, uh, I don't know about you, but we also really, uh, I should mention at the beginning, we now have a very uh, accurate test to tell if you are a social drinker, a problem drinker, or an alcoholic. And this test can be administered at any time. You go into a bar, you take everybody's whiskey glass, and you put a fly in it. The social drinker will pick up the glass, see the fly, immediately call the bartender and say, I need another drink. The problem drinker will pick up the glass and see the fly, remove the fly, and drink it down. The alcoholic is real easy to pick out. He's down at the end of the bar. He's got the fly by the back of the neck yelling, spit it out, spit it out, you know? And what you folks are doing right now is one of the nicest reasons for me to come here and do this stuff. I love to hear people laugh, you know, because I know some things about laughter that most people don't know. And one is that you cannot laugh and think at the same time, you know. So every time you are laughing, you're getting a respite from your favorite subject, which is you. So, you know. And if there were a song in AA, it would be, I am always on my mind. I am always on my mind, you know. The other thing I know about laughter is it's very healing. You know, it's a very healing effect. And it it allows us to produce endorphins. It's very good for our system. It allows us to create our own chemistry, which is good for us. 
So if you are in an Alcoholics Anonymous room, you are already a winner, and if you get a chance to laugh once in a while, that's really, really terrific. As I said, I came into AA back in New York, and I remember going to my first meeting, and a guy told me at that time he was going to be my temporary sponsor, and this July, God willing, I'll have 27 years, and he's still my temporary sponsor. I don't know if it's going to work, you know, <laughs> but he seems to need the drill, you know. The other thing I, I know about Alcoholics Anonymous is that if you be an alcoholic of my type, then the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is a big relief. You know, I, I like to tell the newcomers that if you're an alcoholic of my type and you are not in an AA meeting, you are homeless. And it's not until you find the program and you're able to start on the journey of recovery here that things begin to go well for you. This is, a, this is the darndest program because everything, as we hear over and over again, is paradoxical. There was a little teacher 2,000 years ago, and he told people that the kingdom of God is within. Alcoholics thought he was trying to mislead us. And uh, so we always look for things without. And one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous that I have found through my experience is the way out is the way in. And if you take these steps, just as they're given in the big book, a lot of good meetings have one here, but, uh, <laughs> but, the, uh, but the, uh, this is some of the material from the big book. But, but the deal is, is that if you take those steps, then things begin to happen. It's not about thinking about the steps. It's not about talking about the steps. It's called taking the steps. You know, it's a program of action. And what you find out in Alcoholics Anonymous, everyone I have ever talked with or shared with has found this out, is it's a program where you find your way on the way. You know, we have a gambling place back in our area that's uh, run by the Indians. And... Um, and there's a great sign in there and they're, when they're raffling off the cars. And the sign says, you must be present to win. And boy, if that doesn't apply to an alcoholic, you know, like, <laughs> you must be present to win. You know, I was a lot of places where I wasn't at, <laughs> you know. And uh, I don't share a lot about the way it was because, to be very honest with you, I don't remember most of it. You know, and those things that I remember most vividly never happened. So, so it doesn't leave you a lot of material to work with, you know. And what I like about Alcoholics Anonymous is, is that, particularly the old timers, because they always chime in usually at the wrong place. You know, you have a newcomer who's sharing something along the lines of, well, you know, last week I was in a jacuzzi with five nude women and all the booze that I could possibly want. And you get some old timer says, hey, you'll never have to go through that again. You know? <laughs> We're going to give you this big book. You know? <laughs> and you wonder what's going on with him, you know. And, and so the deal is, is that, you know, particularly when you're working with newcomers, it, it's good if you maybe can weigh your words just a little bit. You know, as I said, I hang out with guys who are who are like home entertainment units, except they're not home, you know. And, and they say the most wonderful things, and, and that's why we hang out together, because uh, each one of us looks good in the other's company, you know? And a guy was talking a couple of weeks ago about this Unabomber thing, and he said, you know, Ken, he said, uh, uh, that guy lived 20 years in the mountains in a cabin with no electricity and no running water. You know, I'm really surprised he didn't go crazy. You know, you know. You look at a guy like that, and you say to yourself, you know, the hamster's dead, but the wheel is still turning. You know, like uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm glad you shared that, Swifty. You know, uh, and the deal is, is that when I when I started into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no idea what it was about, and yet by reading the Big Book. I was able to come to a lot of realizations about my own life. There was a time in my life that I thought I would live a life in such a way and do something that was really worthwhile that someday somebody would write a, a book about me. 
and they did. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> you know? And in that book, it points out real clearly that if you be a real alcoholic, then you have these tendencies to do these things. And it's written for guys just like me who look when there's a dead bird, you know? <laughs> It's, it, it's so specific. It says, if you're an alcoholic and you drink, something happens. How detailed that is. You know, like, if, if you be an alcoholic and you drink, something happens. You don't have to read a lot of other books. That kind of sums it all up, you know? You know? I was one of those alcoholics. I scratched stuff that didn't itch. You know, I just was, you know, I... I got in line without a ticket. I mean, I was just, you know, it, I, I never knew what was going on, but I was there. And if I wasn't there, I was trying to find out where there was. You know, we have great bumper stickers in San Diego, and several years back I saw one. It said on the back of a truck, which way did they go? How fast are they moving? How many are there? I must find them. I am their leader, you know? And, and I thought, that's me, an Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? That's the whole deal here. And, and what I have found out from my own experience is that there's a flow to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, one of the things I hear commonly shared, and I'm in total agreement with it, and that is that this is a spiritual program. And I also, from experience, have noticed that we are spiritual beings. So if we are spiritual beings in a spiritual program, then the problems that we have, regardless of how we label them, are spiritual problems. Now they come dressed up in other costumes. It could be relationships, you know. I'll just let that go. Alcoholics have done for relationships what Woody Allen has done for Planned Parenthood. You know, like, a, uh, you know. Or it may come as monetary, or it may come as something else. But the bottom line is, it's a spiritual problem. And the book is very clear about this. It's, it, has a, it has a sentence that says, whenever we are disturbed, it is our fault. That's the spiritual axiom here. It's not about what other people are doing or not doing. One of my observations here and my experience is, is that I live by the ocean, and I get to see the tide go out, and I get to see the tide come in. And sometimes in life, that's the way life works. It seems as though everything is coming your way. And it's a period of consolation. It just seems that I'm in harmony with God. He's in harmony with me. There's no question whether he exists or doesn't exist. And it just seems as though everything is right with the world. Consolation. Then there are other times when it seems as though the tide is going out. And nothing seems to be going my way, by my definition. And I don't seem to have what I want out of life. And I feel as though God has gone away somewhere. And he's forgotten who I am. And during that period of time, I begin to think about things that I have no business thinking about. And I'm able to tell myself a story that sometimes I believe. But the bottom line is, it's going to come back in again. It's, it's a soul cycle. You know, it has nothing to do with anything else. It's just a soul cycle. The book says, you know, we suffer from a spiritual malady. And when that spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And you get to a point where you realize that what I perceive to be something else has always been a soul sickness. And it's based on the fact that I just don't understand what's going on. And you know, I, my mom understood me probably better than any woman who ever lived. And she knew that I shouldn't think, <laughs> you know? She would walk into the room, and we used to have a little 12-inch Admiral television when we were growing up, and, and it was really good. I mean, you know, we had seven kids watching a 12-inch Admiral. And my mom would see me there, and if that set was turned off, she'd tell me to turn it on, you know? And she'd say, don't sit there. Because my mom knew that every time I thought, I placed some part of the world in jeopardy. You know, like, you know, something was going to happen. And, and she knew that. She used to look at beer cans when I was drinking, and she'd say, I don't know what they put in here that makes you act so stupid. You know? But that was just the fact that she could see the reality, because I had that kind of a mindset. I was very much like the guy who was making a pact with the devil. 
and the devil came to this guy and said, I want to make a pact with you. And this guy was an alcoholic, and of course he was a good alcoholic. So he said right away to the devil, what are the terms of this pact? And the devil said, very simple. He said, while you're alive, I will provide you with all the alcohol you want of any description, and I'll provide it to you as often as you need it and want it. And the alcoholic thought for a minute, and he said, okay, what do I do for you? The devil says, simple. When you die, you give me your soul, and you spend eternity in the fires of hell. The alcoholic looked and said, okay, what's the catch? You know? <laughs> You know, and and that's the kind of mindset, you know, that I have going on all the time. It's like, I just don't know. And yet not knowing has never kept me from voicing an opinion. You know, having no information about the topic has never slowed me down, you know. I can jump in and somewhere in the middle of it change my mind and be in controversy with myself, you know? <laughs> and I can do it as easy as turning the water on and off, you know? I, I can be on this side and then on that side and then I haven't quite made up my mind who I am or where I am or what I'm doing. But it doesn't slow me down, you know? I used to come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I hear people talking about wanting to control this and wanting to control that. And uh, one of the big sayings used to be, I want to get all my ducks in order. Remember that? I want to get all my ducks in order. I used to say that. And then I took these steps. And not the first couple of times, but somewhere after the umpteenth time of taking them, I had this great enlightenment. And the enlightenment was and is, they were never my ducks. <laughs> and I was trying to control and make things work where I had absolutely, as the book said, no power to do so. And in doing that over and over and over again, I would get used up in the areas where I could be doing something good. You know, I, I'm one of those people where I can be right in the middle of a bad idea and get a worse one. You know? You know? You know, things just come to me, like, you know, they just come to me. One time I thought it would be a great, a great way to make money would be to sell hearing aids over the telephone. You know, that's the kind of mind I have, you know. I sit there and contemplate things like if my knees bent the other way, what would chairs look like, you know. This is what's filtering through, you know. And, and you guys only catch this act for a short time. I'm here all the time, you know. You know? I'm here all the time. I, you know, I uh, sometimes think that my choices are the greater of two evils. You know, it's like, uh, what's going on here? But today, what happened, I remember my sponsor, who I have a great deal of admiration and respect for, and uh, he told me one time, he said, you're a wild man. You are really a wild man. But if you stay in Alcoholics Anonymous and continue to do the things that are suggested here, someday you will be a disciplined wild man. And you know, that's basically who I am today. I am a disciplined wild man. On the outside, I still look like flakes or us, you know? <laughs> you know, you can look through my eyes sometime and see out the back of my head, you know? But, uh, but the bottom line is that internally, I'm very comfortable almost all the time. Now, that doesn't mean I don't sustain discomfort, but, you know, one of the things in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love this, people talk about wanting to live a spiritual life. And if you take the word spiritual and you write it down on a piece of paper, what you'll notice is inside the word spiritual is the word ritual. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a ritual. And it doesn't make any difference whether the tide is coming in or whether the tide is going out, whether I'm in consolation or desolation. Doesn't make any difference. The bottom line is, is I do the same ritual all the time. That's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Things are going good. What should I do? Go to meeting, help others, be of service. Things are really hitting the fan now. <laughs> Go to meetings, work with others. You know. You know. And what I notice is that when it hits the fan, it's not always dispersed evenly. You know, like, you know, <laughs> there are some days you feel like you're getting more than your share. You know, and it looks like somebody is going totally untainted. You know. <laughs> But the deal is, is that in order to be a, a spiritual giant in AA, you have to be a disciplined midget. 
And that's the part that people seem to have the trouble with, and that is doing the ritual over and over and over again, going through the steps, allowing life to happen, trying very hard not to interfere in my own life. And that's a tough deal. About, about three years ago, uh, my youngest son was touring the world, and he was doing something he always wanted to do, and that is he wanted to entertain. And he was an entertainer, and he sang, and he danced, and he was on a cruise ship that was going around the world. And I got a call that he was in Norway and that he was sick, and they were sending him home. And he arrived home in July of that year, of 93, and he was in full-blown AIDS. And he stayed with me for the next two months. And during that period, I had a chance to learn more about life than I ever knew before. Because I had a chance to be there for someone I loved and cared for very much, and yet I was powerless to do anything about it. And I had the opportunity to watch him completely deteriorate and maintain his sense of who he was. And that's an amazing story unto itself. I know I'm not unique. There's people in here who have been with loved ones when they die. But there's something about that experience that alters your life in a way that you can never look at life the same way again. Because for the first time, it's like the goose is out of the bag. It's like there's no permanence here. This is totally impermanent. And if something is alive, I can tell you three things about it that applies to all of us. And that is, it will die, it will go away, or it will change. And that's the reality. And in life, we're trying to hold on to. Alcoholics have a way of holding on to things, you know? We, we think that they should be a certain way because mentally, that's the way we want them to be. And it's not until we can accept the ebb and flow of life that things get real peaceful. I mean, I, I know that God has a sense of humor. My, my ex-wife started coming to my home, you know? I got to meet my husband-in-law, you know? And I got a chance to experience life in its, to in its totality, and that is, is that this is not going to be the same. It's never going to be the same again. And I had a chance to see actions taken by my son that made me aware of actions that I took. He had this neuropathy real bad, and he crawled on the floor because he, he, he was too skinny. He had gone from 190 pounds down to 110 pounds. And he was so lean that he, uh, he just couldn't use anything in the bed on, as a bedpan. So he used to crawl to the bathroom. And I, as a parent, never understanding that this would ever happen in my life, got to see my son crawl on the floor to the bathroom in order to maintain his dignity. And I would put down comforters and pillows and so forth. And one night it came very clear to me in the wee hours of the morning as he was making this crawl, which took up to an hour to go, maybe 20 feet. And that is, I crawled on the floor and lost my dignity. And here was my son crawling on the floor and maintaining his dignity. So what I began to see with a great deal of clarity is the neutrality of actions. They're neither good nor bad. It's just what's going on. And, and thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous, because Alcoholics Anonymous has a way of, of getting around somebody who's in trouble to the point where you, you, you kind of have it lessened without even asking for the help. You know, I sponsor a lot of guys, and they just started showing up. And these are guys who don't do their own cleaning, you know. You know, they're 90s guys. They do half the cleaning and, and, and half the shopping and half the cooking, but they all live alone, you know. <laughs> and they began to help me do things, you know. And, and, and the reality of that is I got a chance to see the AA community in my life really come to the fore. You know, we tell a little story in Alcoholics Anonymous, a poem about footprints in the sand, and that when we're most in trouble, there's only one set of footprints, and that's, as the story goes, God carrying us. That was not my experience. My experience was the sand was full of footprints. People were coming and going and just, you know, what can I do? How can I do it? You know, you want me to wash the clothes? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? And, and these are guys that, these are the guys who, you know, are, are not the brightest bulbs in the room, you know? And I got a chance to have these guys come to the house and it was like, really get a chance to be alive with them while this other thing was going on. And, and they kept me going. You know, they, sometimes they would come out with the most unbelievable things. 
And you know, when, when, you're, when you're sometimes pressed to the glass, it's amazing how a good laugh can buy you another 10 or 15 minutes. And, and I was pressed to the glass then, but I had a chance to laugh at a lot of things simply because these guys were very laughable, you know? They would swing by and remind me. In fact, one guy came one night to, to, to want to know if I needed anything from the store, and he ended up taking some food. You know, that's a, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? You look around and stuff's gone, you know? And the deal is, is that you realize that, you know, these are the kind of guys that, you know, that you really want to have around you when you go into the wall. And I remember when I was, uh, long before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, uh, I used, to, uh, used to run numbers for a bookie in New York. And I remember going to him because people were talking about God and, and I didn't know a whole lot about God. I mean, I went to church and I understood the fundamentals of it, but I really didn't know a whole lot. And his name just happened to be Vinny. And I said, Vinny, what's the deal here with this God? And he said, what do you mean? I said, do you think there's a hell? He said, why are you asking? So I told him, I said, I don't know anything about this. He said, Ken, how long have you been running numbers for me? I said, two and a half years. He said, do we ever lose? <laughs> I said, well, someday, some, no, 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 don't start with someday. Do we ever lose? And I said, no. He said, you think God's going to make a game he loses? <laughs> you know, that made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> he said, you think God's going to go through a whole game and then lose? You know, like... And I realized then that there was so much more of what was going on that I couldn't see. You know, one of, the, one of the readings that we use in the big book, or one of the things we refer to is William James' variety of spiritual experience. And he talks about in that chapter on mysticism that there's various levels of consciousness. And that we have one level of consciousness, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other levels. Bill talked about being rocketed into the fourth dimension. You read the big book and... Well, I show it to you, but anyway, they uh, only cost about five bucks, you know. But uh, but the uh, but the deal is, is that uh, it, it talks about in there about being enlightened and awakened, you know. And it says as you become conscious of His presence, it doesn't say when He arrives. And the whole reality here is the great reality, you know. There's a great reality. There is one who has all power. That one is God. We're constantly led back to the same reality, and that is the reality that I had when I was drinking was not reality. It was what I made up. And on any given day, I could have made it up to be, you know, I could have been the cop or the arrestee. You know, it, it didn't make any difference which role I was playing. They were all delusional. And that's another thing, and then I'm not, I'm not at argument with anything, but one of the words that has gotten into Alcoholics Anonymous is denial. I have nothing against the word denial, except for alcoholics, it's real, real wimpy, you know? If you look up the word denial in a dictionary, it says, somebody who knows the truth and doesn't want to admit it. The, the big book, doesn't use the word denial. It uses the word delusional. Now you look up the word delusion, you got yourself a word, you know? It says psychotic thought, you know? Where the individual has no idea what reality is, you know? Actually, in my group, when you get to denial, we call that spiritual growth. You know, you, you, know, you get there. You're heading in the right direction, you know. You're just a clipping along now, you know. You're right on the heels of rigorous honesty, you know. You know? But that's the deal, you know. Delusion. We're driven by a hundred forms of delusion, you know. And that's the deal here. We want to remember. That's when the newcomer comes in. You know, you want to remember you're dealing with someone who doesn't have either or in the water. <laughs> you know? And no matter what they say, they think they're thinking it. 
they think that fact is whatever they say, you know? And, and the reality is it really isn't, you know? It's like, no, no, no. You know? <laughs> but keep coming back, you know? This is what it's all about, the newcomer. Yeah. Somebody who has that look like a cat on the freeway, you know? Yeah. Somebody who thinks serenity can be achieved through a phoneless cord, you know? You know like, these are the newcomers, you know? And you see old timers having real discussions with them. Like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm. And, and, and I love to and, and just watch those newcomers with the old timers. You know, the old timers have these great lines. You know, a newcomer will say like, how come every time I ask you a question, you answer with a question? Do I? You know? And, uh, and, I, uh, you know? And, and they have that, you know, they always have a twitch to them, you know? You know, at any moment, they could go off, and, uh, and you just hope you're there to see it. And, uh, uh, and so, so you, you develop weapons against, old timers develop these weapons against newcomers, and that is disarming things, things that keep them going, you know, but don't, don't taint their water too much. And, and one of these that I've developed over the years is, you know, I remember John Madden, who used to coach the Raiders at one time, and he was a very successful coach, and I remember him sharing this from a podium at a speaker's, not an AA speaker's meeting, but a, a public forum where he said, one of the things he used to do is after the Raiders got through the locker room at the halftime, he would look at them, and before they went out on the field, he'd say, okay, this half, let's forget the mule and just load the wagon. And the guys would go, ah! So guys were going to the Hall of Fame and then calling them up saying, Coach, what does that mean? You know? And he had no more idea what it meant than they did. But it, it seemed to work, you know, and that's really what you're looking for. It seemed to work. Well, I developed this little thing which is good for the guys I work with. I, when they press me too hard, I'll just say, remember, the fish in the sea are not thirsty. Then I go get a cup of coffee, you know? <laughs> And, and then you watch these guys, you know, go through this helter skelter, you know. And then about 10 minutes later, you look over and there's like four or five of them in the corner. And I'm like, well, you'll know the fish in the sea are not thirsty, you know. And then that night, you'll get a call from some guy, hey, Ken, does that apply for the fish in the streams and the rivers or, you know. So you know right away he has a PhD, you know, like, uh, you know, yeah. And that's the reality of Alcoholics Anonymous. Sponsors just keep you laughing and confused until God can get a chance to work with you, you know? And, 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 and they, the real old timers, we have a guy in our area, he's 53 years, and he kind of just doesn't answer. He's, in fact, he's here. You he was here at this convention. And he, he doesn't kind of answer things, he just grunts. Mm. And then, like, it's interpretive. Like, I think he said this. No, I think he said that. No, I think he said that. Uh. And that keeps the guy going almost three, four days. Like, I, no, no, I think it was that. No, I think it was that, you know? And, and that's what we do here, you know? And, and this is like, you know, when I lived in the city, we used to, as kids, always say, we were just wise guys, is what we were. And people used to say things like, uh, uh, how far is it to the slow boy? And we said, we don't know. No one's ever made it, you know? You know? <laughs> But my favorite one, and it applies to Alcoholics Anonymous because it applies to the steps, is how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer was practice, practice, practice. You know, and that's what we do here. We practice. No one really achieves anything in AA. In fact, when you do, we usually have to make a 12-step call on you, you know? <laughs> Once you know, you know, why go? I know, you know? And the next thing you know, you can tell when someone is phasing out because they start to work the steps backwards. <laughs> they stop going to meetings. They stop working with others. They do very little prayer and meditation. They don't do daily inventory. They know that somebody owes them an amends, you know? They suddenly know God's will, and they work themselves back to three where, you know, they turn their will and their lives back over to them. 
And once they do that, it's easy to go insane and on number two and then pick up a drink on number one. Because now I am the power. And you know, the old timers back east used to have these great sayings like, did you notice that if somebody doesn't want to go to AA, nothing will stop them? You know? And that's the way it is. Well, he's making a cameo appearance, you know? And these guys kind of float in and float out. And I got a chance to stay here with guys. You know, I, I got this a guy at this convention who was at the first meeting I went to. And uh, he had just lost his wife, and I was separated from my wife. And uh, we hung out together. And he used to come visit me when I uh, moved to California. And now he's my neighbor. He lives right across the street. And you know, those things just happen routinely in AA. Things that shouldn't happen just start to happen. And the thing of it is, is that what's going on around me is out there. But fortunately, you guys have armed me with the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And being armed with those steps, I get to create the environment inside where I have to live all the time, whether I'm at a meeting or not at a meeting. And you know, the miracle for me of Alcoholics Anonymous is that we get here. You know, if you're sitting in a chair tonight, you're a winner, ring your bell, you know? You are a winner. And it doesn't make any difference what you did to get here, there's still more to be done if you wanna go back out, you know? Something will happen, you know? And so I like the guys who come here who are like me, they just get in the car and they go to meetings. Where are we going? Shut up. <laughs> oh, okay, I think we were there Thursday, you know, like, uh, you know? And I had good sponsorship when I came in. My sponsor was the kind of guy who didn't say a whole lot, but everything he said was a visual. You know those kind of people? He came to see me and I was, you know, I used to talk to him on the phone and I, it's, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I was a real whimper and whiner. You know, I would say things on the phone at night like, geez, my wife left me. And he'd say, good for her. <laughs> And I'd say, I'm in the process of going to jail again. Good, that's where you belong, you know? <laughs> you know, when I was drinking, I had a habit of finding things before people officially lost them. And, uh, <laughs> and he, used to, he used to remind me of these things. And then right before I would hang up, he'd say, hey, Ken, maybe he'll get lucky tonight and die. <laughs> and then he'd hang up. And suddenly everything else went out the window. Now I had some major problems, you know? <laughs> and that's the way he was. And I remember I moved into this apartment and, and the only thing that I had was this little Hummel, you know, from Germany that somebody had given my wife and I when we were married and when she moved, I think she forgot it. So, so I had this Hummel and I had orange crates in my place. And it was like, you know, it was, it was like your basic old junkies getaway, you know? And, and he came in and he brought some coffee and a hot plate and he said, I'm gonna donate this coffee and hot plate. And he was kind of a husky guy and he went to sit down and he had to put his hand on the orange crate and I said, whoa, be careful. He said, why? I said, my Hummel's there. So he picked it up and he said, this Hummel? I said, yeah and he threw it. And I had plaster walls and it hit off the wall and just shattered all over the floor. And he says, now we can both sit down. You have nothing to worry about, you know? <laughs> I didn't laugh right away, you know? I, it, it somehow seemed overpowering to me at the time, you know? I, I had words in my head about his ancestry and, you know, the word mother kept lighting up in the back of my head and, and I knew it was only half a word the way I was projecting it. And, and uh, he had done me a big favor because what he said to me after that is, now you have absolutely nothing to focus on but the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, he was absolutely right. It's amazing to me as I look back over my own experience in this thing and the experience of others, how it's so easy to get diverted with things and objects and accomplishment that seems so urgent in the, in, in the moment. However, when you do it, you begin to realize that you're losing your vision of the eternal. 
And when I lose my vision of the eternal, it's very easy for me to get upset in the moment. And this thing for me has become a deal where I want to be present to win. And one of the things I know from the bottom of my heart is this, there's absolutely no, no moment more precious than this one. This is it. This is the whole deal. You just never, never know when the deal is going to be whistled and the game is over. And when my ticket gets punched, the one thing I want to be sure of is I had the ride. You know, and Alcoholics Anonymous has given me the ride. It's allowed me to do life on a daily basis and, and experience all kinds of things. You know, we were sitting at the table the night I was talking and listening to the people who were there, some old friends and some new friends. And the deal is, is that all of us are in there punching the bag one day at a time. There's absolutely no one who has a lock on this thing. You hear people who you would say, geez, I never thought that they were having any problem with the program. And the next thing you know, they're not here. And so the deal is, is that you want to jump in with the people who don't know where they're going, but they're willing to go, you know? And I remember I said to my sponsor things like, well, it's snowing out. We couldn't possibly have meetings tonight, you know? And he'd say, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Don't disappoint me, you know? And I didn't want to disappoint him, you know? I mean, I'll show you where I was at. I got sober in July of 70, and I was living on the East Coast. And when Bill Wilson died in January of 71, they broke his anonymity. All the papers said, co-founder of AA dies. Now, I was so twisted. I called my sponsor. I said, wow, this is something. It looks like I found something that worked, and now the owner died. <laughs> I thought it was like a company. It was done. Well, you know, it was over. And he said, we'll pick you up. We're going to try to keep the meetings going for a while. You know, like, uh, you know. And that's what we did. We kept the meetings going for a while, you know. And, I, and that's why I like to come to these things, because over the course of the weekend, I know the speakers, the, the AA speakers, I know most of them, and I've met some, and I know the al speakers, and we'll get, we're going to get a, a buffet <laughs> where we don't run out. And it's going, to be, it's going to be this buffet where everybody is going to be coming at it from their own pers perspective. And we are just going to get to go to the well and drink of the water. And we're going to get to share in everything. And one of the things that if you be an alcoholic like me, you'll come to realize is that this whole thing is perception. This is not about what is really going on. It's what about I perceive to be going on. You know, it's kind of like a snail on the back of a turtle going, wee! You know? uh, you, you know? That's who we are, you know? <laughs> and we have, this, we have this propensity for wanting to get back to something that never worked, you know? There's a story told of a snail. I'm on a snail kick now. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I've been captured by the snail god. But there's a story told of a snail who went into a bar and he wanted a drink. And the bartender went over and picked him up and looked at him and walked to the door and threw him as far as he could and said, we don't serve no snails in here. And about a year later, the, the bartender looks up and there's the snail sitting on the stool. And he goes, what the hell was that all about? You know, <laughs> that's... <laughs> took me that long the first time too. You know? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I am your leader. <laughs> but that's the deal here, you know. You know, we, 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 we're looking to be logical in a world where there's no logic, you know. And that's the something, I, that's one of the great lessons. And Alcoholics Anonymous has been an, a series of events and experiences for me that allow me to live in the moment without understanding everything. You know, this is not about logic. We don't live in a logical world. If this were a logical world, men would ride side saddle. You know? <laughs> you know? 
I think somebody in the back just got the snail joke. <laughs> but that's the deal. You know, we scratch, we laugh, we enjoy. And the thing is, is that when this is over, we'll be sober. You know, we'll have another moment of sobriety and we'll have another moment where we get a chance to really live life. You know, you can either live this life or you can survive it. It's usually much better to live it. And if you live it and you hang out with people in AA, they'll make it exciting for you. You know, we are like terrorists in AA, you know? You know, give us a cause and, you know, and we'll get behind it, you know? You know, you look around the room and you figure at any moment, somebody in a chair here can really flip out. <laughs> and we just hope it isn't us, you know, like, oh, you know. And, you, and it looks like sometimes everybody knows the answer and we can't figure out the question, you know. <laughs> you know, you go through life if you're an alcoholic thinking you're a piano player in a marching band, you know, like, a, like that's not who we are, but we have that way of creating that illusion, that delusion, you know? So as you're sitting here tonight, I don't know whether you're in the consolation, I don't know whether you're in the desolation, but it really doesn't matter because you get to do the same thing regardless. And I can tell you this from experience, that if you're in the consolation, it will be followed by desolation. And if you're in the desolation, it will be followed by consolation. And it's the cycle of the soul. And as our souls get stronger and stronger and stronger, we call it spiritual growth. We know the ritual. We march to the tune. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a spiritual bypass around life. It's not an avoidance. It's an awakening. It's not a rejection. It's an acceptance. It's not a knowing, it's an allowing. And you get so peaceful and you, you look at people and you wonder, where are they going? Why are they rushing? They're already here, you know? <laughs> and we're on the forefront of everything. In California, the big thing now is digital communication, you know? Alcoholics have been having digital communication on the freeways for years, you know? <laughs> we have been in the forefront of digital communication. You get your average newcomer, he is digital to the T, you know, like, yeah. Half a peace sign, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're trying to understand the book before we buy it, you know? And, we're, and we're, we're of that mind that somehow, if, I, if we have that neurotic longing to know why, like somehow if we know why, it will be better. And there's no why to it. You know, there's no why to it. I want to thank you guys for letting me come here tonight. I want to thank you for letting me partake of your convention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. And what I would suggest to all of us is that try to listen to each and every person you talk to this weekend in a complete state of neutrality. Don't try to give them their ending while they're working on the beginning. Don't try to anticipate where they're going when they don't know. You know, sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous, we're answering questions that are statements. You know, we're putting question marks where God has already put a period. You know, one of the things I know about language is it's filled with nouns, but in life there are no nouns, there's only verbs. Everything is in process. There's absolutely nothing standing still. Even when we're standing still, we're not standing still. At one time, I thought, you know, for my work career, I was going to starch my tie like that. <laughs> that way, even when I'm having coffee, it looks like I'm doing something, you know? I, you know? And, and you get to laugh, you know? I love the laughter of this thing because people say, you know, I went to hear the speaker. He doesn't know anything. You're absolutely right. You know, like, uh, if it took you an hour to figure that out, you know, you know, <laughs> we meet on Thursday night. Uh, you'd be a welcome addition to our home group, you know? We need people like you, you know? And, and, and it doesn't matter that you're insane because we already know that if you be alcoholic. You know, we're still waiting for the restoration period. 
You know, you know, one of the great pieces of literature that we have in our program, I think, is Dr. Bob's final talk. And in it, he talks about not allowing Freudian concepts to get in and not allowing this thing to get screwed up and to keep it simple. You know, we're basically simple people. We want to be in the forefront of everything and humble. <laughs> you know, we don't mind being second as long as the person who is first looks like they're falling back. You know, <laughs> you know. And he also says in there that we have to remember not to become complacent. We have to help the newcomer. We have to make the newcomer feel wanted. You know, whenever anyone anywhere reaches out, we want the hand of AA to be there. And we want it to be the AA that we came in with that was totally undiluted with anything else. And our kids are going to need this someday, and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, and we want it to be the same thing for them that we got. You know, when you drink, if you're alcoholic, something happens. You know, we don't want to make it any more complicated than that. And Dr. Bob uses a great uh, statement in there. He says, we don't want to become smug. Smug. You know, about four or five years ago, I became smug. My financial condition was wonderful. I didn't know the company that was paying me my retirement was going to go bankrupt. And to show you how smug I had become, I gave away a perfectly good ski mask and pump shotgun. That's, that's how smug I had become. And the reality today is that, you know, it's, it's like the 12 steps in Alcoholics Anonymous is the right tool for the right alcoholic. And the right alcoholic is anyone who wants to stay sober and grow spiritually. I'm, I'm going to share with you a, a story that I, I don't know why, but my mom has been on my mind. I don't always share this story, but my mom was an Irish gal. She spoke with a brogue. She never had much formal education, but she was one of these gals that raised, raised seven kids. My, my dad died when I was young, when, she, when, when, he, when I was young. And uh, he, he was young too, 50. <laughs> And my mom raised us seven kids. And, you know, she used to have these great sayings like, you know, the only time you kids say no to a drink is if you misunderstood the question, you know, like. <laughs> but she used to tell this spiritual story. And, and the spiritual story was very simple. It was about this boy, Johnny. And Johnny went to parochial school. And next to the parochial school was a church. It's called Captive Audience. And every day, Johnny would go into the church and he'd kneel down and he'd say, hello, God, this is Johnny. I just want to tell you I'm here. Then he'd stand up and he'd go off and boogie. Then at noontime, he'd go in and after school, he'd go in. And he'd do the same thing on the weekends and holidays and over the summer vacation. Hello, God, this is Johnny. I just want to tell you I'm here. And my mom said when he was about 12 years old, he contracted polio. And at that time, there was no cure for polio. And she said, as he was lying in his bed and he was dying, he was surrounded by his school chums and his family and his friends. And my mom said, a voice was heard to say, hello, Johnny, this is God. I just want to tell you, I'm here. And that's basically the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not complicated. You know, self-knowledge is the booby prize here. <laughs> you know? We say it in our literature, surely this must be the answer, self-knowledge. And the next sentence starts, but it is not. You know, you know if, you have, if you are someone who's totally unscarred by education, you're in the right place. You've got a good chance here. If you've got a lot of degrees, I'll personally pray for you. Because it seems to be, I have nothing against education, it just seems to be the folks who have it have to hold on to it. It's a valuable possession. And they have to read into the big book things that are never there. You know, I sponsor a psychiatrist. <laughs> He's new. He's in his first six, seven months. The guy who is teaching him to make coffee has a fourth grade education. <laughs> and he calls me and says things like, Ken, not for nothing, but this guy is slow, you know? <laughs> you know? 
I tell him every week how many spoons we put of coffee, and he always asks the same question, how come? You know? And then the psychiatrist calls and says, I do not wish with my education to be belittled by someone with a fourth grade education. To which I always respond in total honesty, just remember, he has the key to the hall. We trust him. <laughs> he does probably the most important chore in AA. He opens the door and starts the coffee. <laughs> you know, this is real simple. This is real simple. It's not complicated. The only time it seems to be complicated is when we start to think. That's why in the big book, There's no chapter into thinking, you know? It's into action, you know? So I know you folks have a lot to do. There's a dance tonight, a 13-step dance. We, uh, thank you. This is the big book. This is the owner's manual. If you don't have one of these, you're lacking an owner's manual. It's nice to see that guilt still works. Uh, someday Hallmark will come out with a card that says, guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. You know? You know? But you folks I know have this 13-step dance. I don't want to slow you down. Pick out your targets of opportunity. <laughs> Remember, the real sick ones look the best. <laughs> God, in his infinite wisdom, does that to level the playing field. You know? Thank you very much for letting me share. Please do me a favor and take real good care of one another because we're only on loan. God bless you.